for this weekend is Professor Jonathan Butterworth, who is a physics professor at UCL and is currently working on the CERN LHC at ATLAS experiment. Given his pioneering work in high energy physics, particle physics, and especially in the understanding of hadronic jets, he was awarded the Chadwick Prize of the Institute of Physics in 2013. Additionally, he contributes to public knowledge of physics with his most recent book, A Map of the Invisible, being published in 2018. Today's talk is Off the Map, News from, en from the Energy Frontier. And without further ado, I will hand over to Professor Butterworth. Thanks, Dawson, and hello, everyone. Hope you can see and hear me okay. Is that working? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Very good. So I'm going to try to share my screen now, but I, I'm disabled at the moment. Can you allow me to, can the host allow me to share my screen, please? I think you have to make me co-host. Yes. Right? Yep. John, yes. If uh, Kelly, you wouldn't mind making John co-host, then we can kick off. So while, while we're waiting for that, oh no, I can do it now. Very good, I was just gonna. Um, right, let me just find my PowerPoint and share it and hopefully go to full screen. Right, are you now seeing my slide full screen? Yes, we are. Very good. Okay. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to come and talk, and and you know the honour of being actually the opening talk of this this fascinating meeting. Um, as Dorsa said, I'm actually if we were in the Institute of Physics building in London, I would be just five minutes down the road at University College, uh, where I do my teaching. But my research is is at CERN, which I've got kind of a wintry um, backdrop of the the globe of innovation at CERN um, there, which some of you may have visited. Um, which is an exhibition centre and is actually about to be is across the road from the main site of CERN, actually right next door to the Atlas experiment, which is my my experiment, which you'll see featuring in this talk in a moment. Um, and I'm, I'm, I expect many of you will will be familiar with the CERN site, but if, as a physicist, it's one of those places you really ought to try and visit at some point. Um, as Dawson mentioned, actually, um, I've written a, a couple of popular books on physics. Um, which I find really interesting because um, I, I find like a really fun thing to do because um, it helps you think actually as a physicist about the metaphors and the way you think about research and the way you think about the kind of the sometimes very unintuitive um, world of, of subatomic physics in particular, which is where I do my work. And you'll see throughout this talk, this metaphor of a map, because I, I what I think of really of what we're doing when we do physics research is actually exploring a landscape of, of physics and in particular in particle physics we're exploring a frontier of um of high energy which is also the frontier of the very small of the of the, the heart of matter so that's the kind of theme running through this talk uh, which I'll, I'll keep coming back to so the world of particle physics really is a world of what we call fundamental particles and, and maybe it's worth saying what we mean by fundamental there. Um, at the moment, what we mean is um, it's as far as we know, um, it's not made a, a fundamental particle is, is what you get if you divide any, um, any piece of matter into ever smaller pieces. The question you would kind of pose in particle physics is does that process ever stop or can you go on dividing it forever, dividing the world, um, dividing matter up forever, does it, or, or do you reach some common set of constituents and the current, our current understanding, the experimental evidence and the consistent theoretical picture we have is that actually that process does stop, there are a unique set of constituents that make up all of matter and those are what we call the fundamental particles. So the first fundamental particle was discovered in Cambridge in um, uh, towards the very end of the 19th century. Um, it's the electron. This is a picture of JJ Thompson who did it and his experiment there, which is essentially a vacuum tube, a cathode ray tube. Um, and by heating up the, the metal in there and um, it, it was noticed that it emitted some kind of ray, they call them cathode rays. And Thompson was able to prove by doing various experiments, essentially balancing electrostatic and magnetic fields and seeing how they affected the, the trajectory of, the, of these rays um, 
to show that they were they were actually particles that they whatever elect whatever voltage you applied on whatever material you put in there um, they were always the same and they were of course the electron so the electron gives us access if you like to the the map of uh, the, the beginnings of the map of, of understanding um, quantum physics into the world of atomic physics which you see here in the, the maps from my book because that's the, the kind of conceit that i'm going to follow through this talk um, and once you're in this world of subatomic physics, of course, that led to the whole quantum revolution. You find that particles have wave-like properties, waves have particle-like properties. And you also very quickly get to this idea that energy and resolution are essentially the same thing. So if you go to high energy, you're going to high frequency. Um, you're going to, um, you know, the Planck's, Planck's constant being the, the constant of proportionality between the two. If you go to high frequency, of course, you're going to short wavelength, and it's the wavelength that gives you the, the resolution to study things. You cannot observe something smaller than the wavelength with which you're probing it. So if you want to really look in the heart of matter, you need to go to very short wavelengths, which means you need to go to very high frequencies, which means you need to go to very high energies. And in these maps that I'm showing you, um, the correspondence works from west to east. So everyday physics, if you like, is in the west, and that's our entreport into um, subatomic physics with the electron. And then as we, pro as we go up in energy, in the story of developing particle physics and developing the standard model of, first of all, atomic physics, then nuclear physics, and then particle physics, is really the story of understanding that. And this, this correspondence, of course, between energy and resolution is just stepping back to the large scales is actually how we know what the universe is made of because it's it's from the correspondence between frequencies and, and spectroscopy and, and and leaps in energy levels that we actually know we can identify the elements in the stars and the galaxies for instance and that's the world where we're operating in on this map so as we go further east um, and we go therefore up in energy and down in distance scale um, a whole world of, as I said, first of all, atomic physics, then nuclear physics um, is revealed to us, and then eventually particle physics. So what you see here is that the, the leptons, um, in the electron, and it turns out to have two, um, two partners, of course, the muon and the tau lepton. Um, we, we see the, period, the whole of the periodic table living there in atom land of increasing complexity, roughly in going further north at some level. Um, you reveal the, the atomic nucleus and the Rutherford scattering experiments, um, and then the, the protons, the, the cyclotron, synchrotron ex, um, accelerators that allowed us to see um, by bombarding atoms with and, and eventually nuclei with very high energy particles, increasingly high energy particles. We see the proton and the neutron inside the nucleus. A whole bunch of other um, part, new particles are revealed, um, which turn out to be. Um, of the class we call hadrons and, and that class of hadrons is of course what the particles that are made up in the end if you cross this energy scale which is labeled there lambda qcd the bridge in the middle there basically you see that they all contain quarks and that's really what defines a hadron it's something that's made up of quarks so neither the atoms nor the hadrons are the fundamental particles anymore but the leptons the electron discovered more than 100 years ago is still as far as we know a fundamental particle and by a circuitous route around atoms and, and through the nucleus and the hadrons, we then come to the other class of fundamental particles, which is the quarks, and you see them there on their island. So this is, you know, constructing the standard model of physics, and these particles, of course, interact via the, the fundamental forces. Um, in particular, the one that's of interest um, when we get further east at the moment is the weak nuclear interaction, the others being, of course, electromagnetism and, um, and the strong nuclear force. I'm focusing on the weak interaction for a little while because that's basically the, the driving force behind why we built the Large Hadron Collider, which is what I wouldn't get to um, very soon. Um, the weak force drives that um, because it was clear as you get to um, some energy level or some degree east on this map, basically, something very different is happening. Okay, And, and in particular, the weak force is very different from electromagnetism because the carriers of the weak force um, which is the W and the Z boson, um, have mass. And the photon does not, and that's why the electromagnetic force is long range and the weak force is short range because of the masses of the force carriers constrain it to be short range because the, the quantum fluctuations in the weak field are not long range because of the mass of the particles. And that starts getting you into some kind of very qualitatively rather different um, 
different region of physics, a qualitatively different um, bit of the landscape of physics, if you like, and led to a very... Um... All right. Hi, Carly. Hello. Do you know why we're here? Uh, Julian asked me to create a breakout session for us. Okay. And that's all I know. <laughs> so, um, is it being recorded? Julian here. Amazing. Well done, Kelly. Thank you. So this is just set up. We should now be able to select to, to join this uh, breakout whenever we want so we can talk live without disrupting the main events. Um, if this is not the case, we'll just need to set up a separate, uh, probably a go to meeting or a team's conversation that we can drop into at any time. Probably using it just from the organizer's Discord. Just yeah, we do have down. a channel. Uh, is it a kind of one that we can talk live to each other, voice channel thing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, excellent. No video, but yeah. Oh, that's good because it's just yeah. So we, you know, the immediacy of being able to hear someone's ask questions quickly and stuff. Mm -hmm. Just to yeah. check, is this going to affect? Because I'm recording now. This isn't going to affect the recording, is it? I hope not. <laughs> I can see that it's <laughs> recording. Out. <laughs> Let's, Kelly, if you don't mind jumping back. Yeah, bye. <laughs> um, we're underway. What you'd expect would happen. So the electron bounces off the proton, smashes it to pieces, um, and you can measure the scattered electron in your detector, mm -hmm. and that's what we do. And that's dominantly an electromagnetic interaction. That's dominantly um, photon exchange. So that blue wiggly line there in the Feynman diagram would be a photon, mostly in that case. Sometimes a Z boson, but mostly a photon. Um, you can see as you go up in energy, the probability of that happening um, drops quite um, you know, logarithmically on that, on that scale. Um, and that's because the, the wavelength of the photon is shrinking, so the cross-sectional area, effective, the effective cross-sectional area is shrinking. Compa contrast that with the, the red line on there, which is actually when it's still deep in elasticity scattering, you're still smashing, colliding an electron with, with a proton and smashing the proton to pieces. But in those cases, um, it's a weak interaction. In fact, it's a W boson exchange. And because the W boson has charge, then the, um, the electron, then the, the, the W carries away the charge of the electron and the electron turns into a neutrino, which actually you can't measure, but you can tell it was there because you have missing energy in the event, basically. And you can still measure the smashed up pieces of the proton. And that happens much less often, as you might expect. You can see there are three orders of magnitude, at, le uh, at least um, there on the, uh, on the horizontal axis between these two at low energies. And that's because it's a weak interaction. And as the name suggests, the weak, inter the weak interaction is weaker than the um, electromagnetic one. And the, but the thing is, as you go up in energy, it doesn't fall as quickly as the electromagnetic interaction. And uh, some energy, which is not coincidentally, about 100 GeV, so about the mass of the W and the Z boson, um, they come together. These forces have a comparable strength. It no longer makes sense to call the weak force weak because the electromagnetic force is just as weak as, it, as, the, as the weak force. In fact, they're, in a sense, they're unified. And that's the scale we call electroweak symmetry breaking scale. There is a symmetry above that scale, um, which is restored if you go above that scale, which is broken in everyday life. And that symmetry is to do with the fact that the W and the Z have mass and the photon doesn't. So it's intimately connected with where does the mass of the fundamental particles actually come from. And most of the mass in the universe, in the visible universe that we see is actually nothing to do with this. It's to do with the, it's the binding energy of the quarks actually inside the hadrons. But in order to make that work and in order to make the electron have mass as well, and in order to make the W and the Z have mass, you need some other mechanism whereby an infinitely small particle can actually acquire mass. And that mechanism was proposed um, by Broughton, Englert and Higgs in the 60s as a general mechanism for how you can have um, what we call a local gauge symmetric theory, which is the only way we know how to write down fundamental theories of quantum interactions. Um, how can we have those symmetries still there, but how can we allow the particles to have mass? Because the mass um, on the face of it breaks the symmetries that you need. And it, this is this electroweak symmetry breaking scale. The symmetry at high energies is still there, so the theory works, but at low energies, 
the theory um, that the, the symmetry is broken and that's why the weak force and the electromagnetic force are very different in strength and that's actually coming from the mass of the W and the Z boson. So that led to a very firm prediction and so well in order for this mechanism this spontaneous symmetry breaking to work there has to be a non-zero um, Which is loosely called the bright angle at Higgs field and an excitation in that field is the Higgs boson. So that prediction was was very strong and it was very closely associated with a specific energy scale on the map. It's very closely associated with a specific degree east actually on my map which is a specific energy scale which is around 100 giga electron volts which in, ma in mass terms is about 100 times the mass of the proton in fact. Um, and the Large Hadron Collider was built specifically to go and explore that. And you can see this is a plot from March 2012 from one of the big physics conferences that summer. You can see the kind of state we were in at that stage. Everywhere on this map that's whited out has been ruled out. There's no Higgs boson there. The grey bits are the last places it can possibly hide. And the green ellipse is where the indirect loop corrections in the standard model tell you it has to be. Um, so you can see it was actually hiding in a place that was probably the hardest place to actually find it um, in, in this whole map. Um, but if it wasn't there, then actually this whole structure of the standard model and how particles acquire mass and everything and, the, and how electroweak symmetry breaking works, which is how they do acquire mass, was all in danger. The axes on this plot are the mass of the W boson and the mass of the top quark, which uh, receive quantum loop corrections depending on the Higgs boson. And, so, and they're just the two least well measured parameters of the standard model at that point. So this is where we were in March 2012, um, basically looking into the last little bit of vague, a vague blurry um, landscape on the east coast of this, of this island. And the Large Hadron Collider was our vessel, if you like, allowing us to explore that land. This is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider, um, which is, um, excuse me, so I'm just checking the time to make sure I'm not overrunning too much. Um, this is a this is a, a view of CERN as you approach um, Geneva Airport, which is the kind of beige bit there. This is Lake Geneva, in, uh, and Mont Blanc is on the horizon there. Um, of course, you don't get to see the, uh, the the yellow line on the ground there. That's marking the path of the um, the Large Hadron Collider. But the farmers wouldn't have been too happy if we actually painted it there. But um, just since we're we're sort of virtually in London here, maybe it's worth pointing out that there. 27 kilometers is to the nearest kilometer the same length as the circle line um, in London of the London Underground, um, which is also, of course, yellow on all the maps, so it's easy to remember. Um, and so the whole of Zone 1 of London basically could fit inside our physics experiment. Um, the, the main CERN site you see on the right of the, the, of the kind of top right of this um, of the ring, and the Atlas experiment is there, um, where the beams that circulate in this tunnel are brought into head-on collision. And the other experiment that was on the hunt for the Higgs is CMS, which is over on the other side of the ring. This is a fairly iconic picture that um, was probably in some of your classrooms when you were um, early in the early days of school. It's from actually from 2005 because it's when we were building the experiment. But but in 2010 and the last decade, it's been it, it was shown around quite a lot. Um, it's a go-to picture for physics often. Uh, in the media. What it is, is the cavern of Atlas at the point just before we filled it up with detectors, basically. Um, and the detector that is in there now, uh, this is an engineering drawing of it. Those, the, this, this kind of the oblong thing there that you see is the, the orange stripy things here, which are the toroids of the, the magnets um, that are associated with the muon detector. But the main reason for showing this, I guess, is you can see it's large. You can see some kind of certain standard people um, scattered around there. Um, to give you some idea of the scale. Um, the beam goes down the middle of the cylinder and each layer of the cylinder is essentially a different technology designed to detect the, the fragments that are produced, the particles that are produced when the protons collide with each other. And one of those, the hope was of course, that one of those particles that was produced would be the Higgs boson. Um, and you know, the Higgs boson um, is this excitation in this, this background quantum field, um, which by coupling to which um, the W and the Z can have mass. Um, the Higgs will not last very long, you could, and by not very long, I mean about 10 to the minus 25th of a second, it will fragment, it will fall apart, it will decay. Um, but it will decay into detectable fragments that leave a characteristic trace in the detector. And one of the ways it will decay is illustrated here. This is a, a graphical representation of a collision event in the Atlas detector. 
um, you've got to imagine that all these are different projections of the same collision um, that you see here. But the big, the main one on the top left, imagine that the beam, one of the beams is coming from back, the back of the screen, one of the beams is going into the screen. They collide in the plane of the screen. And those blue lines that you see are relatively low energy charge particles. You can tell they're relatively low energy because they're actually being bent significantly by the um, magnetic field, which is a solenoidal magnetic field surrounding the collision point. Um, and in fact, the most interesting uh, features of these events, uh, this event here, is not the blue lines because they're kind of fragments, bits of proton that, that are just made. They're very common. It's the yellow blobs, which you see there's one kind of at the top of the, the green circle and there's one almost opposite it down below. And those are what are plotted on the, the un, kind of unrolled Lego plot histogram that you see down below. And they're also what's zoomed in on those two um, green um, boxes down below. What they are is photons, very, very high energy photons. Um, and if you can tell they're photons because they shower very early in the green, in the green um, cylinder, which is the electromagnetic calorimeter. Um, if they were hadrons, they would punch through it further, but because they're, electro, they're, they're, they're interacting electromagnetically, they shower early. Um, and you can tell that they're, they're neutral, neutral, neutral particles uh, they're not electrons, for instance, because they don't have a blue line actually pointing directly at them because the blue lines are, are the charged particles in the event. So this is one of the ways that if you produce a Higgs boson, it can decay. And it's quite a nice way. Um, uh, the, it's quite easy to identify, actually, these blobs. You can see that in the, the histogram there that the energy of those photons stands out for a mile above the rest of the collision event. And if you can measure the energy and the angle of, the, of those photons, so you can do some relativistic kinematics and say, okay, if they came from a new particle, what was its mass? What was the mass of this particle? You don't know what they came from. That's the kind of hidden bit of the quantum mechanics. It's inside the Feynman diagram. And it's like asking what, exa asking exactly what happened is like asking what particle, what slit a, an electron went through in the two slit experiment. You can't do it. You have to take all the possibilities into account. But one of the possibilities is that this came from a Higgs boson. And if you measure all the pairs of photons like this and you do that calculation and, and say, well, if they came from a particle, what would its mass have been? Then if there is a new particle in there, you'll see an enhancement around the mass of the new particle. You'll see essentially a resonant peak, very like the one we saw for the Z boson, although not as easy to find, it won't be as big as that, um, but because the Higgs is rarer. But nevertheless, that's the kind of feature you'd be looking for. So that's what we did. And this little animated GIF is the, it's, you can see in the top right, you can see the date from 2011, 2012, as we collected data ticking by. The vertical axis is the number of pairs of photons, like the one you saw on the event there. And what's plotted on the horizontal axis is the invariant mass of that pair of photons. So if it was a particle in there, what would it come from? And you see there is indeed an enhancement. There's a lot going on in this plot. I'm going to try and play it again, I think, because it's kind of nice. But the so black points are the data, the, the error bars are the statistical uncertainty on that data. So you can see, you know, we have all kinds of chimeras in the data when something looks like it might be becoming statistically significant and then it sinks back into the noise. But the one bit that actually, as the errors shrink, doesn't go away is this peak here around 125 GeV. And that was the first convincing evidence. I'm showing the Atlas um, data here, but CMS had a similar um, measurement of that. Um, and in fact, we also observed the Higgs and we have since observed the Higgs decaying in many different ways. See that, that point right on the, the went really high, really early on, that, that caused us a lot of lost, lost sleepless nights, um, I must say. I, I kind of, you can sort of remember every every excursion in this plot as you from from what it was like while we were looking for this because obviously we were looking the data as it came in. Um, anyway, that's that stacks up as being all, all the different ways we we saw that particle decay. We we we'd see a bump in the same place at 125 GV. The different ways it decayed told us that its charge was zero, that its um, char its charge parity quantum numbers were zero, so they're connected, uh, equivalent with the Higgs, that it had zero spin. All of those things are predictions, firm predictions of the brown englert higgs model, and basically tell you it is a Higgs boson. So we were before the LHC, just you can see the, the flip between these two. Uh, where we are now is we've crossed this bridge, if you like, so it's like a kind of geographical feature in the, in the map is this electroweak symmetry breaking scale where remember the, the weak and the, and the electromagnetic forces come together. 
where the IHC got us over that pit, over that ridge into the new territory on the Far East, and indeed the Higgs boson showed up where the theorists told us it should be. So where are we now? Oh yeah, the slightly more um, conventional picture of the standard model. We have the Higgs boson. Be discovered is it the last well actually according to the standard model um it is the last um the, the standard model predicts no more from local particles it is now we're in a, a particularly strange scenario uh situation actually where we have a, a a rather beautiful consistent and in some senses complete um theory of, of fundamental interactions so you know no point being a physics student you might as well give up and go home because it's all been done which is of course absolutely not true because it's very clear that the standard model cannot be it's not a theory of everything it's not even close it's not even a grand unified theory it's not it, there is many things that it leaves out it, so it's hugely successful in, in describing a lot of um physics phenomena but for instance it doesn't even, even include gravity it's not not part of the standard model um, i'm showing you a rather exotic um of course quite another famous picture from physics which is the um the uh, accretion disk around a black hole in the center of a nearby galaxy which came, i think it was just over a year ago and that that was released um and that the nobel prize was awarded for or led to the nobel prize being awarded this year um but it's not it doesn't you don't have to get that exotic to to break the standard model even everyday gravity that's supposed to be newton and his apple of course even everyday gravity is not actually included in the standard model we do not have a consistent quantum field theory of gravity um, now you could say you could take a sort of pragmatic approach to, to that and say well why do I care about that because we've got general relativity it works incredibly well uh, if I have the standard model for the other three forces and general relativity um, for which is a classical theory for, for gravity and um, to do with the curvature of space-time then you know okay I know if I go high enough in energy and in fact appropriately enough for this meeting if I go up to the Planck energy then it will definitely break because at that point I can no longer ignore quantum gravity but up until that point, everything's fine and, and I'll never get there anyway, so why do I bother? Obviously, that's not a very satisfactory point of view from a physicist's point of view, because we'd like to understand the universe properly, and that's kind of shoving it, brushing it under the carpet. But it, even if you were prepared to live with that, it doesn't work, because if you look at astrophysical observations, uh, multiple astrophysical observations, um, but the most cle the cleanest one, the most obvious one, is probably the um, rotational velocity curves of galaxies, you see that you cannot describe nature just by using general relativity plus the standard model. In fact, um, the, the thing with the galaxies, which you're probably familiar with, is that they're actually spinning too fast. The outer stars are going uh, circular, cir circling the galaxy too fast. You can measure, measure that from their redshifts. Um, by which I mean that the, the, the visible mass in the galaxy is not the gravitational attraction of the visible mass in the galaxy is not enough to provide the centripetal force to keep those stars going round at the speed they're going round. So the galaxy should fly apart. That leads you very quickly to the conclusion that either we don't understand gravity properly or there's a lot more mass in the galaxy than we can actually see. And both those are possibilities and both are being theoretically pursued. By far the most um, favoured one is, is the idea, just because it, it explains, it, Occam's razor really, it explains more with less is the fact that there is dark matter present in the universe. In fact, that about something of the order of 80% of the mass of the universe is not the matter we can see and is almost certainly therefore not the fundamental particles of the standard model because they, none of them have the right properties for that mass for, to be dark matter. So that's, you know, from looking like we've done and dusted and we've just got the standard model sorted out and we understand everything, we've suddenly decided we don't understand 80% of the mass of the universe, which is quite a big deal. And it's even worse than that, actually. Um, there's a fairly uh, cheesy illustration here, um, which is just to remind me to talk about the fact that even the mass we can see, we don't really understand it. Because um, if you imagine everything is produced from the Big Bang, uh, we know from the way the forces behave and the way we see them operate in our accelerators, that if you produce matter, you should produce equal amounts of antimatter at the same time. Now there is some, there's a slight asymmetry in the standard model that can help to generate some difference between matter and antimatter, but it's nowhere near enough to account for the fact that the universe around us seems to be almost entirely made of matter, and antimatter is produced very commonly. And you know we have it, we produce it, so no trouble, it's there. Um, and every time we collide particles, we can annihilate with electrons and positrons together. That's matter and antimatter already, and we'll produce that matter and antimatter in equal um, equal doses, if you like, equal amounts. But what happened then in the Big Bang? Where did all the antimatter go? We, we actually have no 
clue is that presumably the Big Bang produced equal amounts of matter and antimatter if, it, if it's operating according to the standard model. Um, so at some level it clearly wasn't and the standard model is, is, um, is wrong or incomplete again because it doesn't explain this preponderance of matter, of matter over antimatter in the universe. Now I've been focusing on our explorations to the Far East here, which is where we found the Higgs, but actually there are still things to learn about other bits of the map, and in particular this bit down here is where the neutrinos live, and there are some very exciting experiments going on at the moment, the Dune experiment in, the North, in North America under construction, and the NOVA experiment actually going on at the moment, and likewise in Japan, uh, the Super Kamio Kandi, um, and T to K, and T and, um, so Tokai to Kamio Kandi experiment where they're firing beams of neutrinos at, at neutrino detectors, because the big change that happened during my career to the standard model is actually that we know that neutrinos are not massless. In the original version of the standard model, they were massless, but they're, they're not. Um, that allows for a phenomenon, in fact, that was discovered through a phenomenon called um, neutrino oscillations. And that possibility, that opens the possibility that matter-antimatter asymmetry may be violated in the neutrino sector. It hasn't been observed yet. Um, there are hints that it might be there, but they're at the level of those statistical fluctuations in the Higgs plot early on. They haven't resolved themselves into an unambiguous answer yet. That's probably the next big breakthrough in particle physics, I would say, over the next four, three, few years. Um, we will probably know the answer as to whether uh, matter-antimatter symmetry is, is respected by the neutrino sector. And if it's not respected, does the amount of violation actually help us in accounting for um, the gross violation of that symmetry we see in the universe around us and the fact that we're all made of matter and that there's very little antimatter around. So the, although I'm going to go back to the, the, the Far East now, all the action isn't actually just at the energy frontier. There's a lot of cool things to study about this map of subatomic physics elsewhere as well. But going back then um, to, the, uh, to the East Coast, if you like, the energy frontier, which is where I started um, with this talk, um, we're off the map now. We had we had basically a pretty good sketch of what things should look like according to our theory, theoretical physics colleagues, um, right up to the east coast of Bezonia, um, there where the Higgs was was discovered, and we're now kind of off that map. There are plenty of ideas, and there are plenty of theorists who will tell you that right out there in the east, uh, here be dragons, or there's their particular bit of, of theory is true. The you know the extra dimensions, the supersymmetry, there's dark matter out there somewhere. Um, and they've all got ideas for it, but actually there is no clear agreed thing in the same way that there was with the standard model. It was very clear. It was like either everything we think we know is wrong or, or the Higgs is there. And it turns out the Higgs was there. In some ways it would have been more exciting if it wasn't, but um, that would have been a harder, a harder thing to explain to people probably. Um, but anyway, we're, we're there. I like to think I was sitting on, on the east coast of Bezonia gossiping with the, the theorists about what might be out there. But the only way to find out as an experimentalist is to actually go look. So we're, we're thinking already, <coughs> excuse me, how we might do that. So the, the Large Hadron Collider actually has at least another 10 years to run. We, we're going to be starting up in um, early, we still have another year of maintenance and shutdown at the moment. Um, but we'll be starting up in just over a year. Um, and collecting much more data than we have now. We won't go any higher in energy, but we will collect much better statistics. And that does in fact allow you to probe further east on that map as well. But these machines take a very long time to build. They take much longer than 10 years to build. So we're already thinking about what might even, become, even come after that. There was a whole exercise last year um, discussing a European strategy for particle physics. This is a picture of the Alhambra, which were, were partly where we had some of our meetings. Um, the American um, physics community are also now discussing, um, they have a process called the Snowmass process, um, named after a ski resort, which they're actually not allowed to visit at the moment, but sadly, but they're still discussing the physics by Zoom everywhere, um, which is, of course, taking into account the European strategy, because this is a, a global um, endeavor, really. These machines are, are international machines, not just European machines or American machines or Japanese machines or Asian machines, but they're, they're um, clearly global and we all have to take into account each other's um, capabilities and we all want to collaborate on each other's um, machines as well. So that was published in, in Europe and one of its main conclusions was that we need a bigger boat probably. Um, so this is there's a design study being initiated now for what's called the Future Circular Collider, 
you know, in an excess of imaginative naming. Uh, maybe we'll come up with a better name for it at some point. But you see the map of Geneva there with the Large Hadron Collider on it not looking quite so large anymore, and the Future Circular Collider, which is a hypothetical 100 kilometer tunnel, which you could fill with superconducting magnets and would get us a lot further east on this map and hopefully um, show up some of um, those monsters. Well, it will either prove they're not there or it will find some of them. Uh, and uh, basically, though, it's an exploratory device to allow us to travel further east here. Um, there's a lot of technology has to happen, as well as a lot of politics and, find, and financing of things, because it was obviously it's a major, a very large scale project. Um, but one of the most exciting things is actually development of high field magnets and here. And you see it's a global endeavor because this is the team at Fermilab in Chicago, near Chicago um, who are developing the highest um, dipole, highest um, field dipole magnets in the world, which are what we need in order to bend the high energy beam. That is the, the limiting factor on the, on the energy of these beams is essentially the radius of curvature of the tunnel, which is why you need a big tunnel. And then it's it's what's the maximum dipole um, field magnets you can build um, to actually steer the beam around the corners because they obviously they want to go in a straight line um, because they're very very high momentum. Um, so they they've already um, they're, they're already um, testing very very high field magnets, much higher field than the um, the ones currently in the Large Hadron Collider. And a particular exciting technological um, avenue there is actually high temperature superconductivity. If you could build these high, these magnets with high temperature superconductors, then you would save a lot of money and you would be a lot more efficient because of course you don't need the cryogenics. At the moment, the Large Hadron Collider magnets are um, running at, at uh, 1.9 Kelvin. So they're, they're, um, they're all superconducting, which is already a big breakthrough. Um, they, it's the first machine on that scale, the only machine on that scale to use superconducting magnets. But if you could do those without the cryogenics or with less cryogenics, that would be a big cost saving and big reliability improvement as well, probably. So these things are going on. Um, I think it's important to make the, the point, just, just to wrap up, that the, the Large Hadron Collider has moved physics onward substantially, right? We're not just talking about doing the same thing again, only bigger. Okay, I mean, in a way, it's in a, we're talking about new colliders, which at some level are the same thing again, only bigger, but it's in a very different context for what we were doing before. We'll use different technologies, of course, as well, but the physics in particular is different. There's no single best theory beyond the standard model, okay? The standard model gave us a very clear target, the Higgs boson, to shoot at. And there were lots of front runner theories like supersymmetry that, that many, some theorists would tell us we were bound to have found by now, but we haven't. None of this has shown up. Um, and there's, so there's no single candidate. There's plenty of evidence that there is physics outside of the standard model, but there's no single best candidate for what that might be. So we need to a change of approach in the way we're thinking about this. It's a very different game from saying, we're gonna go and prove or disprove this particular theory. What we're doing is exploring a completely new sector of physics, of territory in physics. There's no guarantee that dark matter or supersymmetry or indeed anything else will show up, will be within reach of whatever experiment we build. Um, whether it's a collider or a neutrino experiment or some fancy quantum tabletop detector, there's no guarantee that it will find any of this stuff. But there is a guarantee that some of this stuff must be out or some, something beyond the standard model must be out there somewhere because the standard model is not um, complete and doesn't describe the whole of nature. So what we need to do, and this is what I'm actually doing in my day job now, is making and exploiting careful theory independent measurements. So comparing them to what we calculate with the standard model. I've just given you, because I couldn't resist it, a link to one of my recent papers there, which shows you what I'm talking about, that this is not just words, we're actually doing this now. This is what we do at the Large Hadron Collider. There are very few guarantees in this game. The only guarantee really is that we will find out whether or not the standard model continu continues to operate Far East, in the Far East, way beyond the energy region, the, the archipelago of islands, if you like, where it was developed, does it still, does it, is it still a useful tool? Is it still valid in describing the universe at these even smaller distance scales, these even higher energies, even further east, which is where, first of all, the high luminosity version of the Large Hadron Collider and eventually possibly one of these future circular collider ideas or something similar will take us. And we may, of course, get lucky, it may be, that within the you know within the next two or three years, actually the Large Hadron Collider shows up a candidate for dark matter, for instance. But there's no guarantees. All we can guarantee is that even if the standard model, we don't know whether the standard model is isolated. But what we can guarantee is that if we don't go look, we'll never know the answer to that question. Actually, knowing that the standard model worked to the far east would be a bit, would be a significant improvement in human knowledge. 
Um, but it would be much nicer, of course, if we also found out actually we know we understand that matter by doing that, or we understand the matter anti asymmetry or some of the other various problems with the standard model. Okay, so that's where we are. That's what we're doing right now. Uh, just to finish, I would like to credit Chris Wormel um, for drawing these maps based on some fairly sketchy ske well, sketches that I, I, um, I sent him and uh, some telephone conversations. And they're all in, in the book. I would. I was really impressed. If you if you know, um, I was impressed by how we drew the maps. But it's not surprising in retrospect because if you're familiar with the Philip Pullman books, the his dark materials, um, Chris Wormel is now illustrating all of those. If you look at the new the new book of dust stuff, all the pictures in there are by the guy who drew my physics maps for for this book. So no wonder he was good at his job. Um, and also, I have a little blog there that that some of this is. Um, some more detail on some of these things and, and what happens over the next few years as well will be documented. Um, but that's it. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. I hope I've stuck to time and I hope I've left some time for questions. Um, and that's that. Thank you very much for your talk, Professor Butterworth. I'm sure the students would appreciate it if they could have their cameras on and their speakers on, but they can't clap, but yeah, yeah it's fine. Um, so we will now open up the floor to questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand or you can just post your question in the chat. Okay, um, seems like Henry has a question. So I get, are you gonna chair this dosa or um, you're, you're gonna pick the questions or? Yeah, I'm just unmuting somebody now. Okay, I'll start unmute. Uh, okay, hi. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so about these future, uh, or possible future uh, colliders, uh, like I have been following a little bit about discussion on those, uh, especially about this criticism on whether those are really really necessary and mm -hmm. one of the most uh, like um, common criticism which I hear was basically what you what you stated at, at the end of the talk that we have very little guarantees mm -hmm. and then and then uh, also that if that what would be then the next step if this future collider doesn't really give us any new physics like because because many of current theories uh, as far as I've read and are understood uh, they don't have really any hard like limits on that that mm. at which energies do we need to uh, test them to disqualify them that that the energies can be put all, all, the, all the time higher and higher mm -hmm. so so this is like the question that that what if what if we really don't see anything new then what is what would be the next step yeah it's, i mean that is obviously the question on everyone's minds and i think those criticisms are sometimes valid because so there, there are um colleagues who basically given the impression in the past that we were guaranteed to find various things that we get we were guaranteed to find dark matter for instance and actually only they're really talking about is a is a limited subset of very attractive models usually super symmetry where, where there's a dark matter candidate and with supersymmetry, there actually was, it's quite a good example, really, because there was a lot of talk about if the Higgs is there, you will also find Susie uh, supersymmetry and you will find, therefore, a dark matter candidate. Um, and if you look what's happened in the field now that that didn't happen, it's not like business as usual. It's not so, although supersymmetry was not, um, was not on as firm a footing as the standard model, it was very well favoured because, and it had to be, no, supersymmetry from a string theorist's point of view can be as high energy as you like, it doesn't really matter. But the particular classes of supersymmetry that were being invoked to explain dark matter, for instance, were, were also explaining something about the naturalness of the Higgs mass, and therefore that it had to show up somewhere near the Higgs, and it hasn't, right? Now, there's still a few little places it could hide, but if it doesn't show up by the end of the LHC running, then that's off the table, really. Um, so it's it's a less clear cut scenario than than like the higgs definitely had to be in that region and if we could have proved the negative with the higgs we could have proved it didn't exist there was no way it could just be moved to higher energy to get away from the detector supersymmetry it can be moved away indefinitely 
but you lose certain attractive features. It no longer helps you explain the, the naturalness of the Higgs mass, for instance. So it's not, in, in research, it's very rare that you have an absolutely clear cut decision, uh, clear cut um, situation like the Higgs, is it there or not? Um, but there are lots of qualitative facts. The, the field of theoretical physics has been fundamentally changed by the fact that supersymmetry has not shown up um, at the LHC, for instance. And there's a, a whole bunch of new ideas emerging about what dark matter might be and what other additions to the standard model might actually be more natural than SUSY. So I think all, all I can say is that, well, first of all, it may be that over the next few years, the LHC does show up something that gives us a very clear pointer as to what energy we should aim for. But assuming that doesn't happen, then I think we have to accept the fact that this is an exploration and we have to decide whether we want to be the generation that gives up exploring this frontier because it might be nothing there, or do we want to explore it, bearing in mind the risk that there might be nothing there. Um, and as to what we do next, or in addition, the neutrino experiments, and I mentioned briefly, um, quantum instrumentation, for instance, large-scale coherent quantum systems are actually offering some new avenues for doing precision measurements, so not directly exploring the energy frontier, but probing the standard model in other new ways. I hope that gives you some kind of flavour, but there's no clear-cut answer, I would say. It's a, it's a very live discussion, which you should all join in with, I think. Thank you for your question, Azama. Are there any other questions from anyone? Okay, so Trung, I'm going to unmute you. Should be unmuted now. Um, Trung, you can go ahead and ask your question. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, um, thank you for the talk. So I have a question that might be quite naive because I'm not from high energy physics background. Um, but could you explain a little bit on how the neutrino fluctuations can ex offer a, an explanation for the matter and anti symmetry sure. breaking? Yeah, so the way you introduce them, it, it's um, it's a mismatch of eigenstates is what's going on, okay? So you have... Um, Neutri imagine a coherent beam of neutrinos and there are three there's one way you can decide you can define break that beam down into eigenstates is to say the flavor eigenstates which means is the neutrino produced with an electron or with a muon or with a tau lepton okay now if they're massless then that's all you can do and there's nothing else happens there however if they have different masses then the mass is the mass eigenstates are what propagate Okay, because if you think of it, it's a little wave, e to the i, k, x, and the, the, the mass is the, is the, the magnitude of that um, four vector. So it's the massive states that propagate, and that provides another kind of set of eigenvectors by which you can analyze this coherent beam of neutrinos. And if they don't line up, then there's a mixing matrix between the two. It's a, it's a bit like polarizations of light or something, for instance. And that mixing matrix, it's a unitary matrix. Um, it has three mixing angles and one phase. And we have one of those in the quark sector, actually. We know that the, the, it's called the Kabibo Kabayashi Maskawa matrix in the quark sector. It's definitely there. We've measured it. And in fact, there is a, a violation of matter and matter asymmetry in the quark sector, but it's very small and it's too small to explain the observations. And that's largely because um, the, 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 in the quark sector, that mixing matrix is almost diagonal. The off-diagonal matrix elements are very small. Um, and associated with that matrix, apart from the three angles, there's a complex phase. And it's the complex phase that can give you a violation of matter antimatter asymmetry. Um, in the neutrino sector, we don't know. We haven't characterized that, that mixing matrix fully yet. We know it's there. We're measuring the angles and things, but we haven't measured the phase. And what we do know about that matrix is that it's not like the quark one. It's got some very large off-diagonal measurements, uh, off-diagonal elements. So the mixing is large. Um, and that offers a possibility that if the complex phase is also large, you can get more of a matter antimatter asymmetry that way than you have in the quark sector. Whether it will be enough to explain the observations, whether it will even be there, we haven't measured that phase yet. That's what the Dune experiment and, and Hyper-K are designed to do. Okay, thank that. you. I hope that gives some clarity. I realized as a, as a non-particle physicist, that might have been way too jargony. I'm sorry, but that's that's what's going on anyway. That's right. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, 
Um, while we wait, I can ask a question if that's okay. Sure. So you mentioned that you're looking at theory independent measurements at the LHC currently, but are there any specific measurable predictions of the data beyond the standard model that you could potentially find ev evidence for at the LH LHC? Oh, there, there are many still. Um, it's just a matter of, there are, it's almost like there are so many, so which ones do you take seriously? Um, so uh, the, way, the approach I've been doing, which is in that paper that we did there, that I linked from the talk, in fact, is um, not chasing an individual theory, but, but deciding to measure an interesting process. So one of the things that we recently published um, is the, the production rate for producing four muons, for instance, at the same time. Now, there's several ways you can do that. One of the ways is actually if the Higgs decays to form new ones, it does happen. But there, there are other ways. You can have a pair of Z bosons. There are other processes in the standard model. And there are also many extensions of the standard model give you some exotic massive particle that would decay to form new ones, right? There's this all of some supersymmetric models do that, for instance. Um, generically, things called Z primes, which are heavy versions of the Z boson, will do that. And they show up in all kinds of theories. Theories designed to explain dark matter, theories designed to explain um, quantum gravity, for it, all that stuff. Rather than chase those individual theories, what we do is we go and measure the, the, the thing itself that really is happening. We compare it to the standard model. If it doesn't agree with the standard model, you know you've got something beyond the standard model happening. If it does agree with the standard model, then a lot of those theories you can start constraining and say, well, that must be that theory isn't right anymore because otherwise we wouldn't have seen this thing agreeing with the standard model. And it's a much more rewarding way than say talking to your next door theorist and getting a getting an idea from them. And they say they say, you know, that there should be an excess in the four lepsons cross section. So you go and search for it and you find it's not there, you've kind of got a null result. Whereas if you make a very general measurement that doesn't rely on the motivation of one theory, then you can still say something about that one theory, but you've got a, a, a more generally applicable thing. Plus, if it agrees with the standard model, you've got a very new and precise probe of the standard model prediction at the same time. And have there been anything of interest that haven't matched with the standard model that you've observed recently? Yeah, so nothing definitive, otherwise you'd definitely have heard more about it, it would have been in the papers, but there are always hints, right? We're measuring a lot of things, so there's always, I mean, the, the, the issue is, is keeping your cool and, and not getting overexcited about something that may just be noise. The one that people are most interested in at the moment is actually not from my experiment, it's from the LHCB experiment, um, which is designed to measure rare decays. And they seem to be seeing hints that there's a violation of, of what we call lepton universality. So when in, in various decays, you're not seeing muons and towers and electrons produced at the same rate as would be predicted by the standard model. Um, those things are at the level of, you know, they're three to four sigma, they're not they're not compelling yet but they've been around for a while and they seem to be growing as they get more data plus there's several of them and they do they they lend themselves to a, a coherent set of theoretical interpretations in terms of um, either a bound state of a lepton and quark called a lepto quark or a new z boson a z prime uh, that i mentioned before so what the theorists are doing of course is cocking up new models that will agree with the lhc anomaly suggesting we go looking for those additional predictions which is one of the things you can do in the approach I just mentioned in fact. Thank you. Um, we should know just to say we should know within two or three years whether those anomalies are real or whether they go away but it's going to take two or three years so in the yeah. meantime we're looking at them. Looking forward to seeing whether that's the case. Um, so are there any other questions from anyone? You can post some in the chat if you like. Okay, well, if there aren't any other questions, we have the Meet the Speaker session on Saturday, so you could ask questions during that session as well. Um, so we're just gonna wrap up this, this session. Thank you very much for your talk, Professor Butterworth. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank have a good you. meeting. I hope the rest of the meeting Thank goes well. Thank you. Bye.